Hi folks, Joe from DIY Wood Guy. Hey, this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're not going to be making sawdust in the wood shop, we're actually going to be making some beer. And I've got my cousin Nick here to show us the process, and we're going to be able to share with you an awesome beer. So Nick, what are we going to be making today? We're going to be brewing a uh, clone beer of a Weihensteffen, it's a Bavarian Hefeweizen. Uh, the recipe's been around since the 1100s, and uh, it's a tried and true, very simple, two grain type of uh, Hefeweizen. Uh, it makes a great, good summer beer, about 5% alcohol, and uh, yeah, pretty straightforward, so we should have a lot of fun today. Are they going to put any sawdust in it? Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe we should filter that out. All right. You don't want to chew your beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right, so if you guys like to see how to make some good beer, join us. That's coming up next on DIY Wood Guy. We're going to be doing a Bavarian Hefeweizen today, so I'll just go through the equipment required to brew it. Um, we've got 20 pounds of grains here. That's uh, uh, 12 pounds of German wheat malt and 40 pounds of German Pilsen malt. This is the mash tun, which we're preheating right now with some boiling water or near boiling water. We want to make sure that the plastic is nice and warmed up for when we steep the grains, we don't lose too much temperature. This is going to be primarily just for sanitation. It's just an extra cooler that we have. You need to use a lot of sanitation. Sanitation is extremely important with brewing. You don't want to get an infection. And we have a plate chiller here, which is what we're going to use as our main water supply to fill up the oil kettle. But more importantly, once we're draining the boil kettle after we've boiled the beer, uh, it's going to run through the plate chiller, go from boiling to about 65 degrees in about 10 minutes. This uh, banjo burner is on natural gas, and that's going. It should be able to boil 13 gallons worth of uh, wort, which is what we're going to be doing in about 20 minutes. We've got a couple of additions. So Star Sand is your just your basic sanitizer that we're going that we already used to make up the sanitation. Gypsum is good for uh, water that might be a little bit too hard. It can soften it and get you better extraction when you're mashing. Oral flock will, it's a flocculant, so it will um, we'll add it to the boil to get everything to condense and fall toward the bottom um, so that we don't get that in the final product. And then Campton is basically a dechlorinator, uh, so we don't have you know, chlorine in water. So we're going to take the grain temperature right now to see what we're at, we're going to plug that into a calculator and that's going to help us figure out uh, what temperature we need to heat, what's called our strike water at, which is what we steep our grains in. Uh, depending on the temperature of the grain determines how warm we need it to be. Uh, it's very critical that you heat your mash temperature to get the right flavors out that you want. It's 67 degrees. So with that we're going to use the Modern Brewer app. We have a 10 gallon batch size. It's a 20 pound grain bill. We need to account for the Grain, grain absorption, that's what it's going to be holding on to uh, water wise. We've got, what did I say, 67? Yeah, 67 sounds right. Okay. Mash thickness, we want to mash at a certain thickness, not too watery because if you do, you don't get the, the same extraction. We're going to lose a little bit of beer to the, or a little bit of wort to the mash tun. You can't get it all out, so that's about a quarter of a gallon. There's some dead space in there, also a quarter of a gallon. We're going to boil for 90 minutes. Our boil off rate is about 10.5% per hour, and we're going to lose a little bit to the boil kettle um, when we drain it because we don't want to get all of the uh, sediment um, in the bottom. That's called true. So then it calculates for us we need to strike 6.5 gallons at 166 degrees in order to hit our mash temperature of 152. So our target's 152. All right, so we're filling up a pot here, and we got to get six and a half gallons in. So we've got a simple rudimentary uh, measuring stick here, just kind of watching it until it hits six and a half on his mark. All right, so there's six coming up to six and a half, and stop. All right, there we go, perfect. We're going to add the Campton tablet, and this is to neutralize the chlorine. So it looks chlorines. like a half a tablet? Yeah, half a tablet should be good for our volume. It's probably a little bit overkill, but you can't really overdo it too much. So since we've got a little bit of time while we're waiting for the strike water to heat up, we can sanitize the carboy, and it just lets it, we just want to let it sit with the sanitizer on it for as long as possible. So we made up the, the five gallons of sanitizer earlier. I'm gonna get maybe just a half gallon in. It should be more than enough. That's good. Hand over it and give it a good shake. Make sure that we get it coated. The sanitizer works really well. All it needs to do is come into contact for about a minute and you're good to go, but we'll just leave this in here until we're ready to use it. 
I'm just about 166, which is our strike temp. Now we've preheated the mash tun with that hot water, which I just emptied out off camera. We're going to fill it up with all of this water, which is six and a half gallons. So we can go ahead and start draining that now. We'll have to dump the rest of it. It's way too heavy to do right now. I'm just going to drain the kettle, get the burner off. Temp. Just a tad bit off, but that's probably okay. Okay, we're going to dough in with our grains now. I'm just going to add about half of each bag. We're using German Pilsner malt and German wheat malt, since we're doing a German beer. So after this sits for an hour, it smells really good. just add our rice holes right now. So this is going to prevent the sparge from getting stuck when we water the beer through this, which basically is a fancy word for draining it. We want to make sure that we don't have it stuck and not have the flow. So we add the rice holes, kind of stir them all in. I'm kind of in a hurry to get as much of this grain in here as possible since we missed the strike temp just a little bit. So it should turn out this way. Why just put the different holes? Um, just because you can get dough balls if you put too much in at once and they're kind of hard to break up. Or it just clumps together and then you've got dry pockets in your grain. You want to make sure you get full extraction, so we'll spend a little time just making sure that there's nothing lingering. And is the volume of grain that you're putting in very precise? Yes, yeah, so it's 12 pounds of the German wheat, and 8 pounds of the Pilsner, or the Pilsen malt. Which we yes, that's that's correct. Uh, but we, what we are aiming for is a uh, a thickness. Uh, I think it's 1.25 to one uh, water to grain, and that'll give us kind of a soupy texture. Yeah, it's pretty thick down there, so we'll get a good stir on it. Once I'm done with this, I'll cap it and we'll let it sit for an hour. And what that's going to do is it's going to release the sugars from the malt, which is what we'll then boil with the, uh, it's called sweet wort. And now we wait an hour. Okay, so now what we're going to do is fill the boil kettle with 9.2 gallons of water and get it pretty close to boiling. We're going to use that to rinse the grains. Um, after they have their chance to soak, we're going to rinse the grains with near boiling water. That's going to stop the enzyme production and also loosen up those sugars so that we can drain it more effectively and get a nice efficiency. Okay, so we've heated up our sparge water to about 200 degrees. It's not totally critical what it needs to be at, but we've got 9.2 gallons of sparge water here. The mash tun is just about finished with the uh, mashing. It's been in there for about an hour. So what we're going to do is drain this into the cooler and then we're going to scoop it out into the mash tun to rinse the grains. Okay, so we've got our grains, 20 pounds of it here in the mash tun. It's been sitting at about 160 we, we struck it with 167 degree water, but it should be about 152 because you lose some temperature with, uh, the, temp with, the, um, with the temperature of the grains. Um, so it's been sitting about 152. What we're going to do next is a process called Vorloffing. We're going to drain out in this pitcher uh, the first runnings, and there's going to be a lot of sediment in that. We're going to pour it back on top of the grains, and what that's going to do is seat the grain bed so that we can use it essentially as a filter and run all of our water through it. Okay, it's been exactly an hour. We're ready to take the lid off of our sealed mash tun and see what the grains look like. That smells really good. Stir them up a little bit. No dough balls. It's great. And so we've had all of the sugars, or as much as we're going to get, 
uh, come out of the grains and just be kind of uh, freely suspended in the water. So our conversion is complete and we're ready to start doing the Vorloff process. Okay, so before we do our Vorloffing process, I think it would actually be good to do what's called a mash out. So we've got really hot water in there, about 200 degrees, plus or minus. We're going to scoop a couple pitchers of that water and throw it into the mash tun. That's going to help loosen up some sugars and prevent a stuck sparge because we have such a high wheat bill, it's 60% of the total grain bill. Uh, it's very easy for the everything to kind of condense and stick and then we lose our efficiency if we can't uh, you know, lauder, uh, lauder, lauder out very effectively. not really an exact science for the mash out. I'm just going to do two of these. Give it a quick stir and then let it sit another minute. So give it a quick stir. That's going to raise the temperature, hopefully liquefy some of those sugars and loosen them up so that when we go to strain or uh, drain it out they'll flow from the grain a little bit more easily. Since we're not using any brewing pumps, uh, we're going to take the kettle down and set it beneath the mash tun so that we can use gravity to drain and fill it. What we're aiming for is a pre-boil volume of 13 gallons. And so it's been a few minutes and we're going to start our Vorloffing process. We did the mash out with the hot water, it's been in there for a few minutes now. Get our first runnings. Should be pretty cloudy. We're going to go nice and slow because we want to not let the grain bed collapse too quickly. And you'll see some little particulate matter floating around in there. It might be hard to see on camera, but it's not as clear as it's going to be. So we're going to take this and pour it on top of the grain bed now. And we don't want to disturb too much, so we'll try and get it on the back wall as much as possible. It's a little bit more critical if you're doing fly sparging, but what we're going to do is a batch sparge, which is where we just dump volumes of hot water in here instead of letting it rain on the grains for an extended period of time. This is a home brewer technique. It's much more simple and straightforward than doing a fly sparge. Uh, fly sparges involve draining water out at the same rate that you're letting water rain in and giving a couple hours for that process to take place. This works just fine for the home brewer. So as the uh, grain bed compacts, or uh, settles, you get clearer runnings, clearer and clearer each time you do this, so there's much less uh, floating material in there. We had some pretty dirty rice holes uh, to prevent, the, um, uh, prevent it from getting stuck, the watering mechanism, uh, but it's clearing up pretty quickly, which is great. Same process, just pour it back in the top. It's getting clearer. This is our third running. Not really seeing any floaties, maybe a couple. But we're just clarifying the beer and settling the grain bed. So we're taking a high temperature silicone uh, hose. I'm just going to drop it in the boil kettle here and hook it up to our spout. You still want to drain slow. We can go a little bit faster than when we were Vorloffing. We want to try and not get it too oxygenated. Not splash around too much. So we're just about finished with our first runnings. Uh, we're draining the mash tun for the first time. Uh, first runnings are actually what, back in the old days, they used to use to make the big beers. And then when they have their second runnings after we rinse their grains again with that hot water that we have set aside. That would be more of your session ales, your dinner time beers, your after work beers. Uh, they used to do that a lot in the 1800s and before. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to combine all of them. So the first runnings are going to be the strongest, the sweetest, and then it's going to be a little bit more mild for the future runnings uh, so that we can make a nice balanced 5% beer is what we're aiming for. So our total sparge is 9.2 gallons. We've already put two pitchers into the mash tun uh, for the mash out process. Um, each one of these is a half gallon, so we'll be putting in 16 more. That's eight more gallons of water. This 
This is about 190 degrees. I just measured the temperature off camera a few minutes ago. We're just going to start scooping it in to the mash tun. And we're going to stir it up, let it sit a few more minutes, and repeat the process. So with this process, you can be more aggressive. Just pour it right on. And that looks like we're just about at capacity there. Stir, because we're going to go back through the uh, lottering process and the vorloffing, which will give another chance for the grain bed to settle. That's why we can we don't have to be delicate when we pour in this batch. Okay, so we're just doing our vorloff for the second batch sparge. Uh, it's nice and clear now. I've done a couple already, but you can see that there's no sediment in there. It's gotten a lot lighter. Um, we've got probably one more batch sparge to do, so we'll repeat that process, and that's mostly because we ran out of volume, or headspace in the mash tun. It's nice and clean here. I'll dump this back on the grain bed, and we'll get it nice and settled and start draining it in. Just don't want to disturb the grain bed, because we're, we're trying to seed it right now, so just pour along the sides, nice and slow, and repeat the Vorloff process. So we're going for a pre-boil volume of about 13 gallons be right about to there. Okay, so we've transferred all of the sweet wort into the boil kettle, and we're starting to get heat on it right now. It's about 170 degrees. Uh, we're going to boil this for 90 minutes, and at the 60 minute mark, which is 60 minutes remaining in the boil, so 30 minutes from now, we're going to add our hop addition. Okay, so what we're waiting for right now is called the hot break, and that's where the proteins go to the surface of the beer. Uh, we're going to skim those off because that's what creates boil overs and can lead to some off flavors. We're not there just yet. They start showing up at around 200 degrees and I think we're at about 180 right now. So we've got a little bit of time. You can see we've got a very full kettle here. Um, should be a good beer. Okay, so we're just waiting for the boil over or the, uh, the hot break right now so that we don't have a boil over. You can start seeing the surface is changing. You're getting some white foam. That's the start of the protein content on the top. We just need to keep a good eye on it at this point. We're probably at about 200 degrees would be my guess. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a boil now, which means we need to watch both the temperature and the hot break. Start skimming it off. Hopefully we don't have to rush and shut it down too quick. And this is really where the beer needs to be babysat until our hop additions. Um, then we'll need to babysit it again, but once we get this hot break off and control the boil, we can step away and start cleaning some supplies. Uh, otherwise we'll be doing that later. Yeah, it's going to be a good boil. Okay, so the reason that we skim off the hot break is because a lot of this stuff kind of gets sticky. You can see these uh, gummies here. This is probably because of the wheat content of the beer, but that was ultimately going to end up in the beer if we didn't skim it off. So I'm starting the timer now since we've got it uh, full boil going. We skimmed off the hot break and that means it is time to start the 90 minute timer. I just do a stopwatch and I'll remember after 30 minutes have passed to do the hop addition and then we're going to have some additional uh, products that we introduce to the boil as we get closer to the finish which we'll go over. Okay so I forgot to take a pre-boil gravity sample and it's important so we can find out what our efficiency is. So I'm just going to pull it from the kettle. It hasn't really had a chance to boil off and change much so we should be able to get a pretty accurate number. I'm just going to drain off about a cup. So we cooled down our wart sample to take a gravity reading. Uh, normally, you don't really have to pull it off a boil. You do it before you put the wart into the boil, but I forgot. I'm going to get our hydrometer. Set the hydrometer in there. And give it a little spin. And our pre-boil is at about 1.040. Pre-boil gravity is at 1.040. Our target was 1.038, so it doesn't get much better than that to only be two points off. We're hitting our numbers perfectly. Uh, it's a sign of a good beer to come. Okay, so now that the boil is on autopilot, uh, this is a great opportunity to clean out our mash tun. You can see all the little floaties that were in the, um, the lottering device, which is just a braided stainless steel. I'm just going to rinse it out so that it doesn't stick and create a gooey mess that we have to spend extra time cleaning up later. We've got a little bit more hot break to skim off that I missed earlier. And this is really just, you can see how much thicker it is this time. 
stringiness to it. And dump it in this mason jar. A lot of this would have settled in the bottom of the kettle at the end of the boil, but rather than risking it going through our plate chiller, which we'll talk about in a moment, or uh, ending up in our final product, it's nice just to get it out of the boil while you can. It makes a big difference. Okay, so we're coming up on about 30 minutes into our boil, so we're about ready to do our 60 minute hop additions. These hops are going to be in there for 60 minutes. And we have the Hallertau Mittelfruch. It's a German hop with an alpha acid rating of 2.6%. So it's not a very bittering hop, which is why we're adding three packets. We want to bitter the beer enough to take out the sweetness, otherwise it would be sickly sweet, uh, but not impart a real hop flavor, which is why we're adding them so early into the boil. Uh, the main purpose of these is to offset how sweet the wort is. And they smell good. Okay, we're about 32 minutes into our boil. That's close enough. We're going to add in our hop addition now, and we need to be very careful. It should respond pretty quickly, so hopefully I don't have to panic and turn it down. Filled up pretty good. Okay, this should fall back into it, but I'm just going to give this a little bit of help. Just mix it in a bit. So we're about 80 minutes into our boil, and we've made it through most of the steps. We added the yeast nutrient about five minutes ago, and we're going to add the Whirlflock tablet, this right here, and this is a flocculant. It's going to get all of the sediment that's floating around in our boil to kind of solidify and condense. When we do a whirlpool, which is where we just basically stir the boil uh, at flame out, when we turn off the flame, it'll get everything to settle into the middle. Uh, and that's so that we don't have to get it into our carboy. It keeps it nice and clean. Your final beer doesn't get any of that gunk in it. So we'll be adding that in just a second. So Hefeweizens don't need a Whirlflock tablet, but um, it's nice. It, it's okay to still do if you don't want a whole lot of sediment floating around. Hefeweizens are usually pretty um, cloudy, so it might not make a huge difference, but it's good practice. Uh, maybe keep some stuff out of the beer that we don't want in there. Okay, so we're just at about 90 minutes right now, so we're about ready for flame out on the burner, but I'm going to grab the uh, brewing spoon that we've got sitting in our sanitized solution because it's going to be going into the boil. I'm going to shut off the flame. We're at 90 minutes, stop the boil, and we're going to come up top and start a whirlpool. There's still a lot of movement, but we can at least get the motion started. We're just going to spin it. And what this does is it gets everything to go in a cyclone motion, which uh, puts it ultimately in the center of the boil kettle. It'll condense and solidify into a, what's called a tube cone. It's just a cone of material that we're going to try and keep out of our fermenters and out of our chili. We're just going to let that sit for a few minutes and mellow out, and then we can start our chilling process. Okay, so the main reason we do the whirlpool is to create a tube cone, which is in the bottom of the boil kettle here. That's all of the stuff that we want to try and keep out of our carboys. We could have let it sit for longer and have a much sharper tube cone. Uh, but we're just trying to keep as much of it out as we can. It is a Hefeweizen, which is naturally a cloudy beer. Uh, but we're going to try and leave as much of that behind as we can. And uh, that's why we do the Whirlpool and we add the Whirlflock tablet. So we have the plate chiller right now. We've got water running through it. And we're about to open the valve from the boil kettle to run through the plate chiller. We're going to do a temperature check in the Pyrex dish here. And if everything looks good, we're going to fill up our carboys. We've got two carboys here, six and a half and a five gallon. Should be more than enough for our batch. There we go. A little fast. This is really just for our gravity check and our temperature. So it's okay if it splashes. It's actually okay if it splashes regardless. It's good for oxygenating the wort. You don't want to oxygenate it when it's hot, but when it's cold, that's just fine. So we're going to check that real quick. Seventy-two, seventy-one, seventy. Perfect. As long as we're below 70, we'll be okay for pitching, which is when we add the yeast. So since we hit our uh, temperature fine, we can check the gravity. It's actually right around where the hydrometer is calibrated for. We're going to pour this sample into the, the vial here, into the vessel. 
And uh, this is called the original gravity. That's what we're going to be measuring. The way you calculate alcohol content is to take the original gravity reading and then your final gravity reading after it's been fermenting. And you multiply that difference between uh, by 131.25, and that gives you what your alcohol content is. OK, we've let the uh, sample settle down a little bit, so we're ready to take our hydrometer reading and see what our original gravity comes to. Do a little spin. Split the difference, 1.047. Yeah, that should be good. Which is just about what we wanted our original gravity to be, uh, I think pretty much to the number. So, looking good. attempt to give it a little shake to get some more oxygen, get some more air mixed in there. It's going to be nice and aerated for when we pitch our yeast. Get a better fermentation if the yeast has uh, some breathing. Okay, so what we have here, here is a yeast starter. I've taken Weinstefen uh, 3068 yeast in a smack pack, and I've put it in a container, and on top of that, I put two cups of boiled water along with some dry malt extract. You cool it down, and then you combine it with the yeast, and give it a good stir, and then add more dry malt extract, basically a, a simplified wort. You're making a, essentially a very small batch of beer um, for the yeast to feed on and multiply. What we're really aiming for is 330 billion cells to ferment this 10-gallon batch of beer. So we need to take a starter, which only has about 100 billion cells, and get it to grow and multiply so that when we pitch it into our carboys, uh, it, it's not overwhelmed by the amount of beer that's in there. It can actually do its job and convert that into alcohol. Right now I'm just draining out the last of the beer, being careful not to suck up the true. Um, you can usually lose anywhere from a quart to a gallon toward true, and we calculate for that using our brewery calculator, uh, but in the end it's all about getting as much beer out of here into there as possible without getting a bunch of floaties. So I'm just very carefully tipping it. Okay, so we've drained all of our uh, wort into the fermenters, and I'm just about above, just a tiny bit above five gallons in mine. We got five gallons in the other one here for Joe and it looks like we hit our temperature pretty good around 65, 66 degrees uh, which is perfect for our yeast pitch. We're going to aim for more of a clove flavor and so with this particular strain of yeast and this type of beer if you pitch your yeast around 65 degrees you'll get more of a clove flavor if you, and keep it there. If you pitch it around 70 or warmer you get more of a banana flavor. Uh, we did a banana half last time and so we're aiming for something a little bit different and so temperature really does have a huge uh, impact on that. Uh, next up we're going to pitch the yeast and uh, we'll just be about finished. Okay, so we're about ready to pitch the yeast. Uh, we're going to pour what we need into this one and the remainder into that one. We're just splitting what we have. What we just did was dump our starter of yeast between our two carboys. We split it. Uh, but just to talk a little bit about what the yeast is and what it does, uh, we took Weinstefen 3068 yeast, which is a Bavarian Hefeweizen yeast, and uh, we built it up so that we had the cell count necessary to pitch to 10 gallons worth of beer. Uh, what the yeast does is it breaks down the sugars and turns it into alcohol, and uh, we needed about 330 billion cells between uh, two five-gallon carboys in order to hit that number. The temperature that we pitched it at should give us more of a clove flavor, especially if we can hold it there at around 65 to 68 degrees. Uh, that is pretty much the final step of brewing. Now we just need to install our blow-off tubes instead of airlocks, um, and it's going to ferment for about two weeks. Then we'll transfer them either into bottles or kegs. Uh, we're not going to use an airlock on the actual carboy because Hefeweizen's ferment very vigorously, so we're going to use just a large diameter vinyl tube. For this yeast starter, though, because it is active, actively fermenting the yeast that we put in there, uh, we do use a simple airlock and it just bubbles away um, 
as the yeast culture grows and multiplies. Okay, so now we're about ready to install our blow-off tube. We've got the carboy here in the wood shop. It's a nice stable mid to high 60s room, which is perfect for this particular beer. So I'm going to spray down the end of it. Again, sanitation is key. We'll pull off our sanitized foil. Install this end into the carboy. Should be a nice fit. And there we go. Take this end and put it in this mason jar of star sand and water. We've just been using the same five gallons for our brew day. That's perfectly fine for sanitizer. You might have to move it over a little just because of the rigidity of the tube. In about 24 hours, this should be bubbling pretty vigorously. Uh, you'll see a head of what's called Croizen develop on top of the beer. It'll probably come up into the neck, maybe into the beginning of the tubing, just depending on how vigorous of a fermenter it is. Uh, but that's basically a byproduct of the yeast doing its job. And uh, yeah, in about two weeks, it'll be ready for bottling or caking, and we'll be done with the hef. We want to make sure that we keep light off of the carboy, so we're going to drape it in a blanket. Just to keep all light out of it, since it is a garage, there is a window in the garage, and we really just don't want the beer to get skunked or any off flavors to develop from light getting to the beer. This is why beer bottles are dark brown for any beer that's decent. And we just want to make sure that throughout the whole process, up until we drink it, that we keep it nice and dark. Okay, so there you have it. We've got a great uh, beer that's brewing. It's going to be sitting in the garage for a couple of weeks, getting to the final point. And what you're going to not see off camera is the process of either bottling, in Nick's case, or in my case, I'm going to actually be putting it into a small pony keg to be able to go into a keg rater. We'll catch that on an upcoming future episode. Nick, thanks for making this all happen. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Joe.